Right guys, before we get into things, I want to give a shout out to the continued sponsor for this podcast. Uh, Adapt Athletic Performance and Therapy is their name. You'll find them on Instagram. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can click the link in the description to the Instagram page. If you're on Spotify, then you can go into Instagram, look up adapt underscore Sligo. You'll find the page there. All the contact details and stuff like that are on the page. Give them a follow if you can, and the support is much appreciated. Hello everyone, how are things? Ryan Bailey here, bringing you episode number 10 of the Ball Talk podcast. Glad to say today we have the first soccer player onto the podcast, former Sligo Rovers captain and current El Paso soccer player, Richie Ryan. Um, for those of you who don't know who Richie is, Richie captain Sligo Rovers in 2011 uh, to the FAI 4 Cup final, uh, won two FAI Cups at Rovers. Um, I really enjoyed the podcast. I hope you do too. We could go through a bit of a rundown of, of the clubs that Richie was at, his career, um, and the future as well. So uh, hopefully you enjoy. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe or follow if you're on Spotify and uh, enjoy the podcast. Here we go. Enter full screen. Should we go to go? How are you, Richie? Rain, how are you? Not too bad. What's the crack? Not much, not much. I'm just enjoying a bit of peace and quiet here. Mrs. and the kids are gone out, so. Oh, you're sound so you're, you're midday over there. Yeah, one o'clock here now, quarter past one. So it's uh, peak, peak sunshine at the moment. Not too bad. How is, how is Texas? Texas here now, isn't it? Yeah, Texas now, yeah. Um, it's hot. It's yeah. Far, too hot. Uh, I think it's 30, 35 degrees here today, so, um, yeah, that's why I'm, that's why I'm sitting in the shade. You're dead right, you're dead right. Yeah. Uh, how's, um, how's all treating you now, the whole lockdown over there? It's, I know over here, we're, we're moving fairly quick over here, shops are opening up again, now. what's it like over in the States? Yeah, it, it's pretty much the same now, I mean, um, things are starting to open up fairly fast. Um. Yeah, the, the last couple of months have been tough, tough, stuck in the house and trying to occupy the kids and yeah. that, that's that been the toughest part for me anyway, um, trying to keep keep them busy and keep them occupied but thankfully things are opening back up now and shops and restaurants and stuff are opening back up and we're, we're starting back to, starting back, we started back training in groups of 10 now as well so it's not oh, been too stuff. bad. Yeah, we're slowly getting back to, well, when I say normality, it's going to be a new normal, but sure, we're getting back yeah, to it anyways. I, I know, I, I think that's it, it's going to be a new normal, but the quicker we all get used to it, the better, and we can we can sort of move on and just realise that that's, it is what it is now. Exactly. So, Richie, we're going to we're gonna dig into your career. I've, I had a, have a list here in front of me. I might as well call it out. So and when I say Richie Ryan, when I say former Sunderland, Scunthorpe United, Boston United, Royal Antwerp, Sligo Rovers, Dundee United, Shamrock Rovers, Ottawa Fury, Jacksonville Armada, Miami FC, FC Cincinnati, and current El Paso Locomotive football. That's 12, if I'm, if my maths is correct. <laughs> How wow. do you find it? I suppose, yeah. first question, Richie, how do you find the whole moving around? Because like, there's a lot of clubs here you're spending maybe... Um, like a full season with or you know maybe a certain a certain amount of the year maybe not even a full year how do you find the whole moving around um it, it's got tougher it's got tougher in over the last over the last few years especially since coming to since coming to north america um obviously it's a lot more spread out over here um and then we, we've had two kids over the last over the last five years so you gather up a lot more items in the in the house, which means you have to you take you take more with you when you leave again. Um, so yeah, that that's it's taken me a while to get used to it. To be honest, um, back back home, it, it was difficult moving away when I was younger. But then in Ireland, you know, you, you go from one club to the other. It, it's not that much. There's not that much of a difference in distance. Yeah, and like as we said there at the start, like we'll go back to the very start with Sunderland. So. You're, yeah. you're 35 now, so um, if I'm right, you would have gone to Sunderland, what, 19 years ago, 2001? Yeah, 
Yeah. So ta- <laughs> you're making me feel you're making me feel over here. I know, I'm not taking the piss now, right then, but uh we'll talk about <laughs> you going you going over to Sunderland. How did you get over to, to Sunderland in the first place? Um yeah, I, I was fortunate enough. I, I played a I played a game for Templemore FC uh, in Tipperary when I was twelve. They played against Home Farm in a pre-season friendly, and then the following week, Belvedere uh, Schoolboys came down to to play Templemore back home, and um, I was fortunate enough that I played well in that game. And, and after the game, Belvedere approached me, mum and dad, about about going to play with them that season. So from twelve until sixteen. I moved. I didn't move. I I, I played four seasons up with up with Belvedere, and then I, I think back then, it, back then it was you had to be in Dublin to get spotted to go to England. Yeah. More often than not, um, I think it, it's changed now. Thankfully for for players from from the country and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I I was just fortunate enough that I had a few clubs after me in from like fourteen to sixteen. And I, I narrowed it down to, to Tottenham and, and to Sunderland. And it, it ended up, I just felt as if Sunderland was the place that I was going to feel feel more at home. Yeah. And just actually looking at the, I was looking up the Sunderland squads from your time there uh, just today. And there was a lot of a lot of Irish flags beside players' names. So you're saying yeah, that yeah. At home sort of atmosphere. There were a lot of Irish players in the camp. There was, yeah. There was... Um, you know, I, I I was going to be 16 when I was leaving home, so it was important for me to to try and have people that have been through the same as me around me to to make it easier for me. Um, and even within the under 17s, the under 19 squads in the academy in Sunderland, there was I think there were nine or ten, uh, nine or ten Irish lads, and then there was five or six in the reserve team squad who were who had just come out of the academy the year before, like uh, Thomas Butler, Cliff Bourne, um, Brendan. McGill, who ended up going back to, to play at home in the league as well, um, and then the first team squad had the likes of Niall Quinn in it. So yeah. um, the times where I'd been over, the times where I'd been over on trial, um, the the younger players had always spoke well about the older ones looking after them and, and making sure they were always they were always okay. And do you think in your career, did going to Sunderland in the first place did that set you up well at that level of professionalism playing playing football in England? Um, I I'll be honest with you, it 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 didn't. It it took me a long time. It took me a long time really to to realise that that you needed to be professional if you wanted to reach the, the target you set for yourself. Um, yeah. I I I thought that I had a I broke into the first team when I was eighteen, and then the the following year, the following year I had an injury for. I think it was nine nine months, nine or ten months from from August until the following April, and the whole time when I was injured, I I didn't I suppose I I was only nineteen, so I didn't really know how to to adapt and look after myself at the time. Yeah. Um. So I, I was probably doing all the wrong things, whereas now everything is monitored um, by the clubs and stuff like that. So, um. Yeah. I, I just didn't I didn't dedicate myself enough. In that, in that year, you can hear the dog going mad here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't dedicate myself enough in that year of injury, which, which I think hurt me when I came back from injury. Then because I, I probably, I probably painted a picture for myself within the the coaching, the the coaching staff that it was difficult for me to fight my way back from that. Yeah, and then so you leave Sunderland in two thousand five. You have your your spell with with Scunthorpe with Boston United. And uh, and Royal Antwerp as well, and then yeah. of course being being a psycho man, you know yourself. I was always going to talk for a while about Rovers. Yeah, yeah. But if when I say the name Sligo Rovers to you, right, I or I mention even Sligo, what what comes to mind straight away? Just great memories, great memories, and I, I think I, I spoke to somebody maybe a month ago, and I said it's the most uh, it's the most memorable time I've had in my career. Uh, it's probably the most successful time, which. It, in a lot of cases, means it's the most memorable time because everybody likes to have success. Um, so yeah, that, that that's the first thing that that pops into my head. And usually, when somebody mentions like Rovers, it, it puts a smile on my face. And you had you had great success at Rovers as well. I mean, you went yeah. like 2008, 2011. You had three or four years there with the Rovers, two FII Cups in that space of time. 
Um, yeah. And you're suspended for the 2010 final, if if I'm not mistaken. But you got that. Yeah. 20, you got that 2011 final then. Um, uh, let's start, let's talk about the 2010 final first. It was a it's a pure roller coaster of a game. You have to watch it back now. If you even watch the penalties, as you know yourself. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the the 2010 game was for for me, Matthew Blinkhorn. It was it was definitely an emotional roller roller coaster from the minute we woke up that morning and you go to breakfast and all the boys are starting to get the nerves and the adrenaline pumping and you're just sitting there thinking, you, know, you wish you were going to be a part of it, but then yeah. you. We needed we needed to to help as much as we could because I think anybody that knows that squad of players that was there at that time knows how much they were together and how much they got along well together. Um, so it was an an important role for me and Blinks that day to to make sure we helped as much as we could to to make the boys have success. And then the game itself, <laughs> I don't know, you you you, ju- you just get attracted to the penalty straight away because. What happened in the penalties? I don't think we'll ever we'll ever see again. Yeah, for Sligo Rovers or, or, or any or any other Rovers, um, and I'm sure Kieran Kelly would be first to tell you that as well. <laughs> yeah, um, like that that period, let's say from from maybe oh nine to to twelve and thirteen, even after you left Sligo Rovers, for yeah. me, I would have been from the age of nine nine to twelve or thirteen. There would have been a lot of lads my age that would have gone to games um, and we're just lucky that we were at that age going to games and it was sort of a, I suppose, a, a golden era, you could call it, a few years of yeah, Rovers. Yeah. And there were some great characters in that team as well, like all over the field. Do you think that, like the likes of Gavin Pearce and Alan Keane, yourself, Raph, Matthew Blinker and Joey and Doe, like just how, like what was the dress room like with that many characters in it? Just great crack. Yeah. Honestly, just just wild, wild. Like you couldn't get away with anything. Whatever, whatever you wore into the dressing room in the morning, you knew somebody was going to have a go at you. Whatever you're doing on the training pitch, somebody was going to take the Mickey out. You. It was just, and I, I think great credit has to go to Cookie with the, the characters that he brought, because it, there was a mix. There was a mix of everything, and. He, you couldn't you couldn't have taken life too serious in that dressing room or you would have been I, I think you probably would have been out of the club fairly quick. And um, because right. he, even Cookie himself, he, he was constantly taking the piss out of people as well. Um I, there was just, just a good feeling and I, I think the biggest probably people people don't really look back on it I suppose because the success came the year after, but probably the biggest kick up the backside for that group of players was losing the cup final in two thousand and nine. Um, in the fashion that we lost it to a team from the first division, which is not expected to happen, and um, I think the majority of the team was was back again in 2010, and, and sort of felt like we had something to prove. Um, and yeah, they just the crack in the dressing room, and you know, like Cook, Cookie was one of them that win, lose, or draw, he wanted you to to live your life the same way. Yeah, and he'd say that he'd say that to us before games, like. Look, we won't give it your everything tonight, and hopefully we get a win, and you go and have a couple of points together. I know anybody that knows that group of players knows that we all love having a couple of points together. So, <laughs> um, it, it, but like people laugh, and I think at our level of football, it's important to have that that uh, togetherness and that spirit that it, you enjoy spending time together off the field as well, you know, and that bring that brings you together so that you work hard on the field for each other. Yeah. And I, like as you were saying there, fellas, dodgy clothes, calling fellas out and that. Are there any moments that that stick out in the memory that you can talk about on camera? I suppose <laughs> from uh, from that dressing room. Anyone? There's a few the that you can't see on camera. Uh, there's definitely a few I can't see on camera. <laughs> um, no, the, Dan, Danny Ventry was usually was usually the one instigating everything. Danny, I've met many scousers through my career and they've always they've always had a good sense of humour and always been the one to to throw it out. Um Danny was always involved. There was I don't know if Danny not really one that sticks out. The, probably the, the wildest times were, were when we were out having a night out or whatever and they're probably things that can't be spoken about on camera to be honest. Um 
yeah, it, you, you knew it just wasn't a safe place to be. You, you, yeah. You'd literally have to, you'd have to go into your wardrobe in the morning and make a tactical decision on, on what you'd wear going into the training, <laughs> into the training ground that day so that, so that somebody wouldn't take the piss out of you. And it, as you said, it's a special group of players. Um, and I'm not, maybe not when I say a laid back approach, but that approach, as you said, as, as Paul Cook said, you know, you can have them a couple of points after the games. Is that something that you think is missing from football and all sports, really? That, um, that ability to go and, like, you know, relax, have a few points after a game, all that sort of stuff. I, I think it's important. Maybe, maybe, maybe the game has changed a little bit now because there's so much, so much study that goes into diet and sports science and all that side of things. But I honestly think, like, we we were we were fit as fiddles, and, and Cookie knew that because he he put us through a tough preseason. But he he knew we were at that time. The majority of our squad was was mid twenties. Yeah, uh, we're all mid twenties. We enjoyed each other's company. We enjoyed to go out and have a laugh, and we we enjoyed being in Sligo. Sligo is an enjoyable town to be a part of, and especially when the when the team was doing well. Um. I, I, I thought it was very important and I, I still think it's important, especially at League of Ireland level of football, USL over here. Um, because you don't necessarily have the the level of player that's going to make such a big difference. Like that's that much talented, that much more talented than the player next to them. So I, I think it's important to have that collective togetherness that you, you're good friends. You, and I know... I'd do anything for my friends. So yeah. if I can build that connection with teammates, then I'd do anything for them as well. And um, I think that's, that's what Cookie, that's what Cookie built there. Um, I, I don't know. Jamie McGuinness told me, told me a story when he was signing for Sligo Rovers and he, he went, he came up to Sligo and had a, a meeting in the office with Cookie. And uh, one of the first questions Cookie said to him was, do you like having a pint? <laughs> And you know, at that time, it's a tricky question from a manager because you don't know what Are they the trying to answer. pull a fast one on you, like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, Jay's response was on occasions. Yeah. And Cookie said to him, "Cookie said to him, well, you better get your get your act together if you want to fit in around here." <laughs> and like Jay was like, from from day one, then he knew that it was going to be a good a good atmosphere, and, and Cookie was very laid back and wanted the, wanted the players to be happy off the field as well. Um, wanted us to be so happy off the field, Rain. We were playing Shamrock Rovers. You might have heard this one before, but this is one of my favourite stories about Cookie. Um, we were playing Shamrock Rovers away on a Friday night. And I think they were, it was 2011. Yeah, because Jay was there, 2011. And uh, we, we needed to beat them to stay in contention to for the title race and um, we were training out in Riverstown and we just started doing a jog around the field and getting loosened up and whatever and so, somebody brought up something about bacon sandwich or something and Cookie said oh I'd fucking love a bacon sandwich now and then Davo was like yeah I'd take one as well gaffer and then Jay McGuinness just cracked a joke and said oh I'll give me missus a shout and she'll put them on for us and literally, Cookie stopped right there and said, "Go and call your missus now. Yeah, go, go and call your miss. Go and call your go and call your missus. Tell her to go down to the shop in Riverstown and get a load of bread and bacon for the lads. And we will stop training right now if she's willing to do it. And we we didn't train. You didn't train at all. And we didn't train. We stopped the session. We were only doing the jog around the field at the time. We hadn't even started the session." And this is the day before we went to play Shamrock Rovers. But he, he knew we were, we were prepared. He knew whatever we'd done the day before the game wasn't really going to influence how we were going to play on a, on a Friday night. Yeah. And we went and, uh, we went and John Dillon scored the winner. Um, he scored, I think he scored a header at the back post. We won 2-1 we won away from home. But like, if you were to say that to people, the preparation was like that, they'd say, ah, no chance you're going to win tomorrow. Yeah, jeez, that's daft. But but he he knew he knew how to how to look after players and how to 
like how to manage him. Yeah, his player management. Like, his player management was was another level. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he knew how each each person each personality would could deal with different things. Um, she so had a bacon sandwiches were lovely. <laughs> Come here, Richie. You're, for the last five ten minutes or so, you painted this picture, an ideal scenario um, within the Sligo Rovers camp, the players, the management, everything. I suppose the next question is, um, why did you go to? Why did you leave Sligo? Um, it was probably it was just an opportunity for me, Liam, to to go back across to the UK, uh, to go to the SPL, which is regarded as a bigger league, I suppose. Um, yeah. And yeah, I sort of felt like I, I had something to prove to myself um, after being in the UK before and and not really working out the way I, I would have liked it to. It was a chance to, to go across and and try and put things right, um, which didn't didn't pan out the way I I intended it to, but um, it, it was difficult. It, it, it was difficult to leave Sligo. I, I remember we were still celebrating the cup final. Um, I think it was a Tuesday or the Wednesday, and I, I, I think it was in Fiddlers, and Cookie was beside me, and we were just chatting, and he said, you're gone, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I think so. And he said, no, I, he said, I agree with you. I think it's, I think it's the right time for you to go and chance it again. Um, because he 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 was aware that there was there was a couple of clubs watching me, so, um, yeah, I I just felt as if it was the it was the right time for me to go. Lane, I could I could have stayed on the year after, and you know, I would have won the league with the club, and but that chance might never have come for me again. Yeah, and like uh, if you listen to um, uh, Patrick Holbin's interview with um with EJ EJ Men's where they're. There yeah. the day and he went over to England as well and it just it just happens that it works out for some guys and some guys it doesn't work out for that's it and you know I, I never want to look back on my career and, and say oh well I didn't take a chance on or maybe I should have done that or maybe I shouldn't um, you take a chance on everything cause you, especially in, in football career doesn't last long um, and, and some things work out, and some don't. You can't really, you can't really dwell on things for for too long. When guys go from Ireland to England, that's the, I suppose England is the the place that everyone wants to get to to make the big break. But in other way, yeah. you found your you found your break. Um, I suppose what it'd be f- five years ago now, six years ago when you you headed over to the states. Yeah. Um, like, like I said, things didn't things didn't pan out. They didn't pan out the way I I wanted them to. Going going to Scotland and eighteen months after after I moved, I was I, I was told I could leave the club with with a year left on my contract. So obviously I had had a couple of things to think about, and uh, moving to America was was always something that m- moving to America or Canada over over to play football over here was always something that interested me. I kn- I knew the game was the game was growing rapidly over here. So um I I think it was at that stage where I I thought they, I'd played in Ireland for a few years, Rain, and then I'd moved back back over to the UK and it hadn't worked out and I, I just fancied a fancied a new challenge. Um so I, I ended up I was sitting in the garden one day in, in Dundee and I started following a couple of agencies on, on Twitter, and one of them one of them got back to me, and within a couple of days, he had a he had an offer from Ottawa Fury for me. But it wasn't an offer at that time; it was just them saying they wanted to sign me, but they weren't they weren't able to give the offer until um, the end of the NASL season that year, which which was November time. Okay. So it meant that it meant that I was going to be without football for for half a year. Um, and that that was when I went back and signed for Shamrock Rovers for half a season. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to move over to America, as you said, it's something that you always wanted to do. But there is the like there is a barrier there as well, where you're like, I'm I'm moving halfway across the world nearly. Yeah, yeah, it's um, <laughs> it was strange. We, we found out the week before we moved away that we, uh, my wife was pregnant. So okay, that was. Put put even more more question marks in front of 
moving away. Yeah, yeah. Well, we said we just, we just go, I'd only sign a year contract, so our, our thought was let's go and try it out for a year and if we enjoy it, we'll stay over there for a while and if we don't, we can come back after a year. Mm. Um, so thankfully, six years down the line now, and we're, we're still here. So I hope you're enjoying it so if you're there, if you're there six years. <laughs> yeah, well, it's probably the only place I can get a contract now, to be honest. <laughs> It's um, as you said there. So you moved to Ottawa first, and then Jackson Federer mad after that. I, I want to get on to yeah. Miami FC, um, yeah. because it was in Miami where you got to play under Alejandro Nesta. Yeah. That it and yeah. uh, Paolo Mandini was a, a co-owner of the club as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean uh, that's we, just that's just stuff you write in your copy book in in junior inference, like, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you have your stickers on your book. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it was fu- funny actually because 2015 um, in Ottawa, we were sitting in the dressing room, and then the Miami club was confirmed for 2016. And the the player Sinisha Ubi Paradopovich used to be at Montreal Impact with Nesta when Nesta played in the MLS, and he was like, "Oh, I think Nesta will be the head coach there." And I said, oh, "What a club that be to play for." Yeah, like never, never, never having a clue that would have happened. But um, yeah, to get the chance to go there, then the following that was probably five, six months after that conversation um, was brilliant. Yeah, and to like I said, to to play under somebody like Nesta was an experience that you could you could only ever dream of. It's like some some fellas that go from being uh, one of the world's best in their position to being a manager it doesn't always work out but what sort of an impact did he have on you? Uh, huge huge I, I, I signed I signed in Miami when I was 31 and the things he taught me within a couple of weeks of the position of the field I played and in the system that we played there I, I was trying to do things the total opposite when I arrived at the club and he was right. like, no, I don't, I don't want you coming in there. I, I don't want my number six in there. I want you in here. And Then I started to see over the course of time why he wanted you to stay in these positions. And you, you see these different patterns of play develop and you affecting the game where he wants you to stay rather than being ineffective in the places I was going into. Okay. Um, so yeah, very tactically... Tactically brilliant, as you would expect from somebody who's played at the the level he played at and what he's won in his career. Um, intensity on the training pitch, a whole another level. Uh, if you did, if you didn't reach the heights that he'd set for you, you'd be on the training pitch for two and a half hours some days, just trying to get right. there. He would keep going and going and going until until he was happy with the with the standard of his training. He didn't care if you were out there two and a half hours. Yeah, and I think that's something that um, I remember hearing Patrice ever say it when he went to when he went to Juventus. There's this perception of the Italian league that it's kind of slow paced and that, but he said it's actually some of the hardest training he ever did was was out yeah. in Italy. And was that something, as you said there, that he might keep you back after training? Was that something that Nesta brought to to the team Miami? I remember my first day of training. I arrived there in the morning. And we train in the we train in the afternoon. And I honestly thought we had a game. We were travelling for a game the day after, and playing. So that was a tour of the evening. We were playing on the Saturday evening. And I honestly thought Is this fellow serious. I'm training this hard two days before a game. I was, I, <laughs> I was honestly coming off the training pitch thinking, what am I signed for here? You were on the phone, I, to Paul Cook. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get moved to Portsmouth <laughs> um, no but it, he, he, he put a lot of physical demands on the team but they, once once you got used to it and your body adapted to it it became second nature to you and then once you start winning games you, nobody has an issue with how hard training is when you're, when you're winning so yeah and, uh, and did you have any um any interactions with uh, Maldini with him being a, a co-owner of the club? He was never there, Ian. Never there at all? Never there. Ne- never seen him once, no. Just, like, <laughs> just signed him the dotted line. Yeah, seen a picture of him 
as the co-owner, but that was the only the only time I ever seen him. Right. Um, yeah. I, I I think it was more a it might have been more a publicity stunt. Yeah. Than than anything else, I'm sure if he was that, involved, he would have been there. He would have been there a few times. So you go from Miami, Florida to Cincinnati, which is Ohio. I'm nearly sure. And uh, yeah. Now you're in El Paso in Texas. How are you finding? I suppose we'll you know talk about Cincinnati as well. But um, since your move from Miami to Cincinnati and now to um, and now to El Paso, um, like what what's the reason behind the move, the constant moving? Is it kind of like the League of Ireland where fellas do move from could move from club to club every year? Is it the same sort of system over there? Yeah, it, it it's it's a very similar very similar league in that respect. Um, a lot of players sign one year contracts. Um, I I was unfortunate, unfortunate at the same time that in in Miami I signed for two and a half years and the league the league fell apart. Uh, the league fell apart two years into my con- or a year and a half into my contract maybe. Okay. So um, I was I was available to leave and I was fortunate enough that a club like Cincinnati wanted to sign me because they, in my opinion, they were the biggest club outside the MLS at the time. Right. And their fan, their fan base was unbelievable. Never, I, I never, I never seen anything like the fan base there. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. And definitely, definitely not in North America. I think when they were in the USL, they might have been like the fifth best average of of attendances, including the MLS. Okay. Their av- their average crowd when I was there in 2018 was 25,000 every week. Wow. So, yeah, that, that was a no-brainer for me to, to move to Cincinnati. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, had a, I had a deal at Cincinnati that was one year USL and we knew they were going to the MLS the following year and I had a deal the second year of my contract was was to go to the MLS with them, um, and then for whatever reason, the manager that signed me on that contract decided that he didn't want to take me to follow him okay. to the MLS. So, um, yeah, that that was that was difficult for me and the family because we, we were very we were very settled in Cincinnati, and yeah. um, to have that news at the end of the year that we had to move on. Um, difficult for us to accept because we sort of said that was that was going to be home for us in, in North America yeah and it's it's different you know moving from let's say Tipperary to Sligo to Dublin it's different <laughs> yeah. from, from moving from <laughs> Miami to Cincinnati like slightly different I, I was down south on the east and then up to was it, the, the midwest Cincinnati and then down to the very south of West Texas like literally just across the border from Mexico. Yeah, like um, uh, how? Yeah, it's it's I strange. How? I'm just gonna say how. <laughs> yeah, that's all, that's all you need to say. Yeah. Um, no, the the manager here, the manager here in El Paso, I worked with at Jacksonville in 2016 for a few months. I was there, okay. uh, an English English coach called Mark Lowry, and we always stayed in touch over the over the last few years. And then as soon as as soon as he knew I was becoming available, um, he made me an offer to come down here for a couple of years. So um, it, it was a good chance for me, a, a good chance for me to come and play for Mark, who I know has the same thoughts on the game as myself. So um, and, and then come here as one of his assistants as well to try and learn that side of the game as well. Because as I've experienced over the last year, I don't think many players realise how much work goes into the coaching side of things. Yeah. Is that um, your outlook on the coaching side of things? Has that changed? Um, and even the amount of coaches involved in a team, I suppose. How have you seen that change from, when, from say, what, 15, 16 years ago? My outlook on it, Ring. Have, how have you seen that change? Like, you know, the amount um, of coaches involved in a team? Yeah, yeah, I mean, with all the technology now, the the studies, the analysing of opposition teams, that that all wasn't there 
14, 15, 16 years ago. Yeah. And, and now, now a lot of coaching is done in the office, watching video, they studying the opposition teams and cutting video and trying to put sessions together and stuff. Um, it, it's literally seven o'clock in the morning until nearly seven o'clock that evening. Um, and you get your couple of hours on the training pitch, which is probably the most enjoyable part. Um, yeah. With, with the with the team, um. So I, yeah. From from a player's point of view, I don't think I don't think they realise how much work goes into the coach as well. Mm. Um, I, it, it's sort of it's setting me up a little bit to to make me aware of of what's next if that's what I want to move into. As you said there, what's next? Twelve clubs is El Paso <laughs> the final stop on the train. Uh, playing wise, definitely, yeah. And do you yeah, want yeah. to, if, as you're saying there with coaching, do you want to go into, um, would, would you plan on going into a coaching role with, with El Paso then? Um, that's, the, that's the plan, Lane. Um, I, I think I have another year left in me playing. And the, the, manager, the manager here thinks I have another year left in me playing. Um, obviously not, not having to put the mileage on the clock over the, over the last few months might help. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did. I, I I think the possibility of one more year of playing is, is is real, um, and probably what I want to do, um, and it just gives me a little bit of time to make sure I'm ready. I'm ready mentally, and I'm definitely sure I'll be ready physically to hang them up at the end of next year. That's what I. And, and, and like you said, move move into the coaching side of things. Yeah. Hopefully here, hopefully here in El Paso. Oh, Richie, we've gone through all the clubs. I've got a few. Um... I asked out on Instagram uh, if there's any questions for you, as you know. Yeah. Um, and a good few people text in saying they were looking forward to the podcast uh, and to text in with their questions as well. But before we go into that, I've got a few names here of players. Uh, when I say the name, I want you to say what pops into your head. No, it can be a memory of them or what, what, you, you, know, what you think of on the field or whatever. Um, I've kind of gone through some of them already. Or off the field. Off the field is even better. Um, the first one is um, is Paul Cook, and I know we've talked a bit about him already, but legend, just the best man manager I've ever had, and just uh, an absolute gentleman, and a, and a madman. <laughs> um, second one there, Owen Doyle, goal scorer, fox in the box. Just one of these natural goal scorers. Josh, it, and you see, you see it over the last number of years with Tyler. You just get the chance he scores. Like there, there's no. The thing I like about Tyler, like he, he doesn't try to be fancy in front of the goal a lot of the times. He just hits the back of the net. He doesn't care whether he thinks the keeper. He doesn't doesn't have to be a pretty finish. It doesn't care, doesn't matter whether it goes in the top corner. It just matters it goes in. And that's why he's he's carved out the career. He's, he's carved out for himself. Another fella who. Went to England and uh, I suppose he's this guy has perfected his craft, Seamus Gorman. I don't know if there's a word to describe Seamus. Um, what she, what Seamus achieved in his career is will never be seen again. To go from to go from I, I would say Seamus at Sligo was when I was there was raw. I, I think Seamus now is a complete fullback. He bombs yeah. forward, he bombs back, he's tenacious, he can defend, he, he can score goals now. I, I think the willingness that Shamey has shown to learn how to become the player he is today um, shows the type of person he is. Uh, he, he just, he's just a driven driven person. That, that's like he was always one of the ones that was, he was willing to work harder than anybody else. Um. Next name uh, is Baco. <laughs> Tight. <laughs> Tight. Tight, yeah. A Good, tight worker, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say so, yeah. Um, m- money daft. Money daft. Yeah. The only, the only man I know that every conversation revolves around money. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, as a footballer, Baco was exceptional for us. Um, yeah, he had a few stints. He had a few stints at the club. Yeah, but it, I, that's an, 
I think it, it shows how good Bocco was as a player. The fact that he'd been away from the club a couple of times and Cookie always wanted to bring him back. And even like Paul Cook brought him with him to a few places as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, was that? Did he have a good mix of a good character and a good work rate and, and a good footballer? Oh, he did, yeah. yeah. He, he was a good footballer. Bocco worked. He worked his backside off. Um, and like I said, really good player. Uh, work, worked hard, good on the ball, chipped in with a few goals as well. Um, and I think that's that's why Cookie took him to. Uh, I think he took him to Accrington, maybe Chesterfield as well. With him. Yeah, he was at Portsmouth for a bit, I think, was he? <laughs> he he no, could have he, been where, where, wherever Cookie's been. Bocco has been. He was in the suitcase with him. <laughs> and very versatile player as well. He he played in a lot of positions was, he, for overs, anyways. <laughs> Right back, right wing, number ten position, striker, centre mid. He, he he was an intelligent player, like you said, and he, he was versatile, so he, he could do the job in in many positions for us. Um, next up, I suppose maybe away from coaching uh, on a personal sort of way, um, Alejandro Nesta. Intense. Okay. Uh, intense, but a genius. Genius with his mindset on the game. Um, just the way he thought, the way he thought about the game, made all his players think about the game in a better way. What was he like in the dressing room? Was he a fellow that would be <laughs> shouting the odds, or? Oh, you, you'd have to just sit there like that, ring and hopefully not hit you. <laughs> yeah, if, right. if, uh, if things weren't going well, absolute nutcase. And then if, if things were going well. As well, but in the, in the opposite way, like he'd scream and shout in the audience like, and congratulate us and you get a big slap on the head or a slap on the face to congratulate you. Yeah, just a very, very affectionate, emotional fella. Um, but, 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 then, but for, I, I think for players at, at our level, that it gave off a great, um, a great vibe from him because it showed that he cared. Because you, you would think somebody like him coming down to manage at a level like ours might not give a shit. Yeah. But it it, sh- it showed us that he get, he cared about us as players and he cared about us winning games. Were the two, and were himself and, and Cook two great coaches, but in different different meanings. Oh, totally, totally different styles. They're polar opposite mm-hmm. styles, I suppose, and they just but they were both still great coaches. Yeah, and I think that's the I think that's the beauty of coaching. You can you can be a good coach in, in different ways. Um, some are good with managing people and managing players, and some some are good on the training pitch. Um, I I think Cookie Cookie was very much a, a man manager. Nesta was very much tactically clued into the game, um, and and not such a good man manager. Mm. Okay, uh, next name up. I've got to mention him, Raf Cotero. Tober Tornado. <laughs> um, nah, Raf, Raf's a legend. Um, but what Raf's done for Sligo Rovers, what he's done for Sligo Rovers and what Raf has done for himself to have the career that he's had speaks volumes about. Um, he, he's probably one of the most dedicated professionals I've ever come across. Um, to I don't know what's he on now. He's thirty second season or something. Um, something daft, all right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just did um, there with us at Real Tubber for Royals. I did. I see. I seen that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then he, he he couldn't stay away, so he decided oh, right, back. to go back again. Yeah. Um, no, he. Raf Raf just like Raf is like Um, you know, and hopefully one day. Hopefully one day he will he will be the manager of Sligo Rovers. So I I think that would be a great tribute for him and and a great move from the club as well. Brilliant. Um, next name probably would have only played with him for a short stint. Uh, Gary Twig. He was he wasn't there actually. Was he not? He, he's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're okay, Rain. Um, yeah, I, I never got the chance to play with Gary Twig. He'd left that season, I think, and moved. Did he go up north? The Linfield, they, they, 
it might have been, and they they signed our Linfield or I can't remember, um, but they'd actually signed Quigs back. So Mark Mark Quigley was back at Shamrock Rovers at that time. Okay, I, I just um, even playing against Gary Twig. I suppose. <sighs> yeah, because that that Shamrock Rovers team was they were, they were the they were the elite group for Shamrock Rovers at that time. Twig Twig was. Just a goal scorer as well. Yeah. Um. It, you knew if he got a chance, he was going to score. The same as same as Tyler a lot. Uh, I didn't think Gary Twig got too much involved in in the build-up play for Shamrock Rovers. He sort of kept himself away from it and just stayed as a an out and out mm. striker for them. Um. And they they were out, they were littered with good players at the time, so they obviously created a lot of chances for him, and and he was he was well able to finish them. Mm. Um, one of the last names now, um, the manager from your time at Sunderland, Mick McCarthy. Honest. Honest. Honest is a word. Honest is a word I use from Mick. Yeah. Um, he was always very honest with me, and at that time I was I was a young player, so I didn't really, I I didn't take honesty at that time very well because it wasn't what I wanted to hear. Yeah, um, which I think is, which is difficult for a lot of players. You, you only want to be told what you want to hear. So, yeah, uh, looking back on it now, with the things that Mick told me at that time, if I had a, if they had a register with me at that time, I probably would have been at the club a lot longer than what it was. Do you think? Uh, do you think Mick isn't finished with coaching? Do you think he's going to go back somewhere else? I don't know. I don't know. It. I think I. Having the career Mick has had at, at club level and international level, and now just finished again at international level, he's not getting any younger. I, I think it might be a big ask for him now to to go back into the daily grind of uh, of club management again. Um, but I, I know he's had stints in in the media work and stuff like that, so I, I think he yeah. might move back into that side of that side of the game. Uh, just a break, break it away from the from the names we're mentioning. Uh, I only saw it today, actually. Um, I think it was called a baptism of fire. Mick gave you. He threw you into the, the time wear derby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't. I wasn't aware that was coming at all. Uh, I only found out the the morning before. Wayne, I, I was supposed to fly home that weekend. I was okay. supposed to fly back to Ireland for the under 18s FAI award or the the FAI awards were on that Sunday, and I was supposed to fly back on the the Friday Friday evening. So I trained with the under 19s. I played a reserve game Thursday night against Liverpool. I trained with the under 19s Friday morning, and I I had my bags packed and everything to to leave Friday evening. And the reserve team manager came in and said, "Look, um, what's your plans for the weekend?" And I I told him I was going back to Tip for a couple of days, and then I had the awards Sunday. And uh, he said, "No, nah, change of plans. You're not allowed to go." And I I said, "He can fuck off, Jockey. I'm going home for a couple of days." Um, uh, and then he said, no, the gaffer wants to see you. He wants you in the squad tomorrow. And uh. I thought he was taking a mickey. And then he took me down to the first team side of the training ground. And the club captain, Michael Gray at the time, met me on the way out the door and just shook me hand and said, congratulations, Rachel. I'll see you tomorrow. Was that, your, just started. was that your first involvement with the first team? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, the first, yeah, that, that, that was the first taste I had. I hadn't really trained with them up until that point. Um, and then, yeah, Mick, Mick just dragged me into the office and said, are you ready? Are you ready to be involved tomorrow? And I didn't really, I didn't really know what to say. Mick, Mick is quite an intimidating character. So yeah. um, I was 18, I was 18 at the time. And for any 18 year old speaking to the first team manager is, is a daunting experience. Um, and he just said, "Look, make sure you you dress smart. Have you got Have you got a suit?" I said, "No." He said, "Go get yourself a suit in town, and and I'll see you tomorrow at the stadium at half one." So I made sure I was there. I was there for about one o'clock, quarter to one maybe, to to take it all in. And I was just sitting around. At that time, it was only five substitutions. Yeah. So I thought I thought I was there was eighteen men in the squad. I thought I was going to be seventeen or eighteen months. 
and uh, they came rolling into the dressing room with 10 to 2, 5 to 2, whatever it was. And everybody, all the rest of the lads were getting changed. And he just looked at me and said, do you not want to be on the bench? I said, what do you mean? He says, do you not want to get changed? I said, oh, I, I thought I was just going to be 17 or 18 months. He said, no, you're on the bench. There's your kit over there. So that was it then. <laughs> on, a, on a went and got on for the last 20 minutes. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it was an ex- a great experience. One that I didn't really embrace at the time because, you know, you're, you're 18, you just you think that that's going to become the norm. Mm. Um, but, but I look back on now with fond memories of it. Was that in terms of atmosphere, was that probably the, was that, would that have been the loudest you'd heard of stadium? Yeah, it definitely was. Like, China Weir Derby is huge. The, the hatred yeah. between the two cities, and hatred is a strong word, but... There's there's a lot of it in the northeast. The two clubs mm. absolutely despise each other. Um, so yeah, to to get on in that game and to to experience it was only twenty minutes, but it felt like it was two and a half hours running around the field. I was exhausted um, yeah. and just the noise that was generated from, from the fans. It was just it was just noise to me. I couldn't make out what was being sang or anything. It was just waves of noise and me just trying to get me breath back after every yeah. run and was there any stage like whether you whether you were sat on the bench or just before you were coming on where you just looked around like holy shit shit yeah yeah <laughs> we uh, yeah, did that every because, every couple of minutes like it, yeah it was pretty much from the from getting out there for the warm up I was thinking what the fuck am I doing here yeah. um, and then Mick told me to go out and get warmed up that was coming on and I'm like oh here we go here we go just please please be okay yeah. Okay, don't do any don't do anything stupid. Don't make any mistake that's gonna cost the team or turn the fan turn the fans against you in the first <laughs> twenty minutes of football for them. Um so yeah, I, I came on then and I remember the first pass was from Jody Craddock and he just rifled the ball into me with uh, I think it was Kieran Dyer or Jermaine Genius was, was putting pressure on me from behind. And I just thought, the ball just came flying at me. And I thought, Jesus Christ, how am I going to deal with this split second? And I ended up dealing with it and just passing it off to Tommy Sorensen in goal. And uh, I thought, I'm not, I'm not able for balls that quick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, no, I, did, I, fit, I fit in okay. And over, over the next couple of weeks, I, I was with the first team full-time and I was with them full-time for, for pre-season. And then I picked up the injury, which led to not such a good spell. Yeah. Um, I suppose, do I, what have I got? I've got two or three more names now um, yeah, on the yeah. topic of, of Sunderland as well. Gary Breen. Gentle giant. Um, yeah, really looked after, really looked after the Irish well as well. Um, anything we needed. A lot, of, a lot of first team players wouldn't make much time for the young players. Um, which, which was tough for the young players to accept, and it just it, it painted a bad picture of of that first team individual straight away for the young players. Yeah. Now he, Gary Breen was one of them that he'd never walk past the young player without saying good morning or asking how they are, and especially especially with the Irish lads, um, which was important for us. There was there was Gary Breen, there was Kev Kilbane, Big Quinny, um. Like the Christmas parties for the, the academy players, the Irish, the, the first team Irish players were organising. Yeah. And they, they, yeah, they come on the Christmas party with us. Wow. Um, so big, big Quinny, Kilban, Gary Breen. Now, Michael Gray and Kevin Phillips appeared on a couple of Christmas parties for the youth players as well, which yeah. they, they probably just fancied a piss up. So. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, Gary Breen was brilliant. I, I remember I was actually in. I was in London on a weekend once and just in, in a bar and randomly got a tap on the shoulder. And this was this was maybe three, four years after I left Sunderland. Right. And it was, and it was it was big Gary Breen. And he just he just came over to have a chat and have a drink and like a lot of players may have seen you and just thought, Well, I, I, I don't know him anymore or yeah. there's no point in saying hello to him, you know, but big Gary was he was different. 
I think uh, like Gary Breen is one of these sort of like cult heroes when it comes to Irish soccer. Yeah, yeah. But like from yeah, what yeah. you've been saying there, I, th- I think a lot of footballers are defined by their ability on the field. But he's a professional in not just the five hundred plus club appearances he made, but a professional off the field as well. Yeah, I think that that's how. Like, you have to remember, you you were a youth team player once as well. Uh, I you want to feel you want to feel like a. Uh, Everybody wants to get to the top level. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think it's important for the older pros and the ones that have had success to, to embrace youth players and, and try and make it as easy as possible for them to and be as nice as possible to them to try and help them build a career for themselves. Yeah. And, and Gary and, and Kev Kilban and, and Noel Quinn were very much like that all the Irish side. I've got the last name on the list. Joey and Doe. Ah. It, how how long have you got? <laughs> um, how long is a piece of string? Ah, stop. You get emotional talking about Joe. Um, ah, Joe, Joe is a genius. Joe, Joe made an impact on on Sligo Rovers that that nobody will make on any club. Um, when we got beaten two thousand and nine in the league or in the in the cup final. And then, like I said, I thought that was a big kick up the backside for the group of players that were there. Um, and I think Joe, Joe arrived three, four, five games into the into the following season. Um, and the impact Joe had on that dressing room, and the way the way Joe just adapted to a chaotic dressing room where the banter was flying every day and nobody was safe, everybody was getting the Mickey taken out, and, and Joe just fitted right in. I didn't yeah. mind if you took the piss. Didn't mind if you took the piss out of him. He'd take the take the piss out of players in his own unique way. Um, because he, he's a different personality than the rest of us. But it, and Joe was what maybe thirty four, thirty five at the time. Yeah. And we 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 were all mid twenties. Um, and he just adapted in, and he he took he took the player each player in that dressing room from from this level to the next level uh, as a footballer on the pitch and as professionals off the pitch I think we all just we all just looked at Joe and seen the way Joe lived his his life from Monday to Friday preparing for games Yeah. and I think ev- everybody without really knowing that Joe had the, was having that impact on us sort of adapted their own lives to that and yeah we, we still we play on a Friday night we'd, we'd enjoy our weekends which which Cookie wanted from us, but from Monday to Friday, Joe lifted. He lifted everybody. He lifted everybody as a professional, which then turned us all into better players on the field. Um, and yeah, he just give the give the ball to Joe. You know, he was never gonna he was never gonna lose it. I think um, he brought he brought something different to the even the fans as well. Yeah, definitely because he's that type of player. He, he gets you off your seat. Yeah. Um, he he's one of them players. Rain, that Joe when he was younger at shells and stuff he was more of a dribbler and tricks and flicks and his time at Shamrock Rovers and when he when he came to us he was Joe was like you know like, he was like a Paul Scholes then he just dictated yeah. the pace of the game he'd drop in get on the ball do a little trick here and there um, and just control games for us yeah. um, so he, just, he was just an intelligent player so intelligent. Um, I, I don't think people speak enough about how intelligent he was as a footballer. Mm. I think that's that's the perfect way to wrap up the podcast now. Um, Richie, thanks a million for joining me. No problem at all, Rain. Thanks for having me on. Um, I think it's it's also that we can nearly have another chat again. We might get a few a few more guys on the podcast who might have you know three or four different different heads dot around here from. Uh, from from that rover's dressing room. <laughs> it, could, it could be you dangerous. Might, you, you might struggle you might struggle to get a word in. <laughs> I just um I'll just let you add it. I just press record and let you add it. Um, and it, there'll probably there'll probably be a few points out of that one. Well it'll have to do. It'll have to do. <laughs> Listen, Richie, thanks William for coming on. Um for everyone watching, hope you've enjoyed or if you're listening on Spotify, hope you enjoyed as well. Um this today is Friday. Well, it'll, this will be going up Friday. So, a big week ahead. Um, 
check out on Instagram who's coming up and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, hopefully you enjoyed the podcast. And 